why do you have to ace the NCAT cards? As you guys know, the other sections are a part of any pre-med curriculum, which means you've already taken the biology classes, you've already taken the chemistry classes, the physical science classes. Um, so you already have that knowledge and so does everyone else. And given that you need to do well on the MCAT as an entire exam, um, it's really important to do well in the CARS. So as we know, a really good MCAT score is 90th percentile or better. So that translates to roughly about a 514 to a 517 on the MCAT. And a good MCAT CARS score is 127 or better for the US or 129 or better for Canada. In case you've never uh, seen any of our past events, my name is Veruz Momeni. I'm the CEO and founder here at BMO. And I have uh, several of our uh, admission experts here today that I'd like to introduce. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Meng, who is uh, our manager of consulting department. And uh, next, uh, it's Ashley, who is our lead coach. Actually, it, uh, Ashley is involved in training a lot of our admission experts, coaching them continuously improving our services. Uh, next is Deepa, who is uh, one of our uh, admission experts, uh, one of our lead admission experts uh, actually as well, and maybe ask Meng to walk us through a uh, passage from a book from Shakespeare. <laughs> Good luck with that, that's what's happening. And mm -hmm. hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions and actually read this. It, it will be quite a, a long piece of text, um, just, just to let you know. That is the that, yeah, and that's the whole point because on the MCAT, the texts that you will encounter are, you know, going to be roughly 600 words long, and this will give you an idea of just how long it could take you to get through a passage, and hopefully this will encourage you to also start prepping and working on your speed as well. Okay. And as I go through each paragraph, um, what I'll do is also talk about the summary of the paragraph so that you guys can get a good idea of what's going on as, as we go through. Okay, so I'll start with the first one, um, and I'll just start by reading it. There are two ways by which the spirit of a culture may be shriveled. In the first, the Orwellian, culture becomes a prison. In the second, the Huxleyan, culture becomes a burlesque. No one needs to be reminded that our world has been marred by many prison cultures whose structure Orwell describes accurately in his parables. If one were to read, if one were to read both 1984 and Animal Farm, one would have a fairly precise blueprint of the machinery of thought control as it recently operated in scores of countries and on millions of people. So before we even talk about the summary of this paragraph, even from this first paragraph, you can tell that this is somewhere in the realm of like a humanities topic. It introduces Orwell, it introduces Huxley, and these are two pretty huge literary figures and philosophers. Okay, so that's kind of the, the topics that we're looking at. The main point here of this paragraph is that it briefly describes Orwell's works on prison cultures and thought control and gives two examples of that as well. Okay, let's look at the next paragraph. That's the beginning of this passage. Yeah, <laughs> that was just <laughs> one of many paragraphs. So let me keep going. This paragraph reads, what Huxley teaches in his novel, Brave New World, is that in the age of advanced technology, spiritual devastation is more likely to come from an enemy with a smiling face than from one whose countenance exudes suspicion and hate. In the Huxleyan prophecy, Big Brother does not watch us by his choice, we watch him by ours. When, in short, a people become an audience and their public business of a vaudeville, vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Culture death is a clear possibility. Okay, so the main point of this paragraph, um, and you can go ahead and ignore any of those big words that you didn't understand, um, that I, even I struggled on, right? That's not the point. You, the point here isn't to understand every single word, but to understand the point of the whole paragraph. And that is that it discusses the works of Huxley, which claim that in this age of advanced technology, um, amusement, and entertainment, the media essentially have become the greatest danger for a nation. Okay, all right, let's look at the next paragraph. Okay, this paragraph reads, in the United States, Orwell's prophecies are of small relevance, but Huxley's are well underway toward being realized. For the U.S. is engaged in, for the U.S. is engaged in the world's most ambitious experiment to accommodate itself 
to the technological distractions made possible by the electric plug. This is an experiment that has reached a perverse maturity in America's consuming love affair with television. By ushering in the age of television, America has given the world the clearest available glimpse of the Huxleyan future. Okay, so this is a comparison of Orwell and Huxley's prophecies, and it specifically suggests that Huxley's are more relevant in American society. Is this passage ever gonna end? It's not, <laughs> it's really not. I think we're only, maybe we're halfway through, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, here it goes, the next paragraph. Those who speak about this matter must often raise their voices to a near hysterical pitch, inviting the charge that they are everything from whims to public nuisances to Jeremiah's. But they do so because of what they want others to see appear benign, appears benign, when it is not invisible altogether. An Orwellian world is much easier to recognize and to oppose than a Huxleyan. Everything in our background has prepared us to know and resist a prison when the gates begin to close around us. But to whom do we complain and when and in what tone of voice when serious discourse dissolves into giggles? What is the antidote to a culture's being drained by laughter? Okay, um, so this paragraph, it keeps comparing the Orwellian and Huxian worlds. And this paragraph specifically points out that the Huxleyan world is much more difficult to recognize than the Orwellian one. Okay, next paragraph. What is happening in America is not the design of an articulated ideology, but it is an ideology nonetheless, for it imposes a way of life, a set of relations among people and ideas about which there has been no consensus, no discussion, and no opposition, only compliance. Public consciousness has not yet assimilated the point that technology is ideology. Okay, so here I think it's a lot easier, it's a lot shorter as well, but the point here is that technology has been normalized and the public consciousness has really not yet recognized that it is a form of ideology. Uh, so this paragraph reads, to be unaware that a technology comes equipped with a program for social change, to maintain that technology is neutral, to make the assumption that technology is always a friend to culture is at this late hour, stupidity plain and simple. Introduce the alphabet to a culture and you change its cognitive habits, its social relations, its notions of community, history, and religion. Introduce the printing press with movable type and you do the same. Introduce speed of light transmission of images and you make a cultural revolution. Without a vote, without polemics, without guerrilla re resistance, here is ideology, here if not serene. Here is ideology without words and all the more powerful for their absence. All that is required to make it stick is a population that devoutly believes in the inevitability of progress. Okay. <laughs> So this is quite a long paragraph, but in summary, what the author is saying is that they believe it's foolish to be completely unaware of the cultural change that technology is bringing, okay? And I, I do believe this is going to be the last paragraph that we're gonna look at. Then we'll do some questions. And then we're gonna look at some questions, yeah. So Huxley believed that if we are in a race between education and disaster, and he wrote continuously about the necessity of our understanding, the politics and epistemology of media. For in the end, he was trying to tell us that what afflicted the people in Brave New World was not that they were laughing instead of thinking, but that they did not know what they were laughing about and why they had stopped thinking. Okay, so the main point of this paragraph is that the author, you know, he's discussing Huxley's teaching from the lack of understanding of influence of the, of the media as the main cause of disaster in today's society. And overall, just to summarize the main point of the entire passage, looking after having seen every single paragraph, um, it's really, this was really a compare and contrast type passage, as you can see the author keeps going between Huxley and um, and Orwell, um, and specifically, he says that, you know, where Orwell and Huxley's ideas about 
thought control are pitted against each other, he really finds Huxley's ideas to be more relevant to American society. We saw that in one of the paragraphs. And he seems to agree with Huxley that the media um, is an agent of thought control and is dangerous. Yeah, so we're going to see if we can apply the main points that we just dissected out of this Carr's passage. We have two passage-based MCAT style questions for you. And we want you to start trying to apply some of those tips that we just talked about for how to tackle Carr's passages or um, passage-based questions. So we have the question here, the first question, the assertion that the introduction of an alphabet changes cognitive habits is. And as you read that question, you want to start to think before you even look at the option choices, what do you think the correct answer might be? And we also want to think about what is the question type two. Okay, so let's look at um, option A. Mm -hmm. True on the basis of low literacy rate in the United States. Option B, supported by objective data in the passage. Option C, perhaps true but not explicitly supported by passage information. And option D, contradicted by the assertion that television watching is pervasive in the U.S. So we first want to identify the question type, uh, which can help us to arrive at the correct answer. And this is a reasoning within the text question because the question is asking you to make inferences based on information presented within the passage. So hopefully you've had a kind of a quick moment here to think about what you think the correct answer might be. And the correct answer is C here, but we're going to go through each of the answer choices and see how we arrived at that answer. So for option A, the author does not reference literacy rates in the US or whether they're low or high. So even if this were true about literacy rates based on your own knowledge of the topic, the information is not presented within the passage. So like we said, CARS is not based on your outside knowledge. So right. this cannot be the correct answer. Okay, so that one we should be able to rule out pretty quickly. Option B, in the second to last paragraph, the author states, introduce the alphabet to a culture and you change its cognitive habits, its social relations, its notions of community, history, and religion. So Meng read that part to us, but the author doesn't elaborate or provide any specific data within the passage, so this can't be the correct answer either. Okay, option C, so the author does state that introducing the alphabet to a culture changes its cognitive habits. This is done in the context of the larger point being made in the paragraph about television's revolutionary impact on society, which was great, but perhaps even greater than the introduction of the alphabet. And this assertion functions to set up a comparison. So the author's assertion must be assumed to be perhaps true in order for the point to be made about television's revolutionary impact for this to be convincing. So this is the correct answer uh, for the question here, but we'll take a look at option D as well. So this assertion contrasts with, but is not really contradicted by, the passage assertion about pervasiveness and cultural impact of television watching in the US. And this was covered when we were just talking about option choice C here. So again, option choice C is the correct one here uh, for this reasoning in the text question. Okay. Okay. And we do have one more practice question for you. So again, we'll read through the question, try to think about what type of question it is and what you think the answer might be. So question two, which of the following findings would most weaken the author's argument about the extent to which US society has fulfilled the Huxley prophecy? So option A, a high percentage of the US adults who watch television regularly have a good understanding of politics and validity of the media. Option B, a high percentage of the U.S. adults who watch television regularly fail to vote in the last presidential election. Option C, more U.S. adults are able to name the judge on the television show The People's Court than are able to name U.S. Chief Justice. Or option D, more U.S. adults have read 1984 than have read Brave New World. Okay. So again, we want to try to first think about what is the question type here, and this can help us to arrive at the correct answer. So this is a reasoning beyond the text question, because the question is asking you to make inferences based on new information that was not originally within the passage. Okay, so the answer here for this one is A, and we're going to go through each of the answer choices and see how we arrived at that answer. 
So for option A, a major point the author makes is that television revolution occurred without resistance from a population that unquestionably believes technological progress is inevitable. The author underscores this point in the final paragraph that we read through, and they state that Huxley believed that we are in a race between education and disaster, and he wrote continuously about the necessity of our understanding politics and media. And he was trying to tell us that what afflicted people in Brave New World was not that we they're laughing instead of thinking, but that they didn't know what they were laughing about and why they had stopped thinking. So it stands to reason after reading the passage that the existence of a US television audience that understands the politics and validity of the media would most challenge and weaken the author's argument. So option A is the correct answer here, but we'll take a look at the other answer choices too. So for option B, this is not the correct answer because this finding would not necessarily weaken the author's conclusion, since this could arguably underscore the author's point about how television has enforced compliance from people without discussion, opposition, or a vote. So if it were true that television watching adults were less inclined to vote, this would be another example in which television reduces active engagement in politics. Okay. Option C, this can't be the correct answer either, because this finding would prove not weaken the author's point about television and how it impacts the reality of television watching adults and removes them from participation in public life. So we reviewed this when we were talking about our discussion for answer choice A. And looking at the last option, option D, even if this were true, this would have little effect on the author's conclusions especially since, unlike the authors, U.S. readers would not likely see television culture in the light of 1984 or A Brave New World. I know when I'm watching TV, I'm not necessarily thinking about um, these books that I may or may not have read. So nothing is said in the passage either about how many people have read either of these books um, relative to how many people have watched television. So if the number of readers of these books was much smaller than the number of television watchers, then even if some of these readers reached the same conclusion as the author, this would have little influence on culture as a whole. So this cannot be the correct answer either. Okay. So that's how we arrived at answer A for this question. Hopefully it was helpful to go through a couple kind of practice questions here.